This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields in the middle and John Cameron down on the other end. Well, gentlemen, um, this Hello. airs on Christmas Day and Congress, in their ways, issued a Christmas present of sorts to us here <laughs> down here in the in the lowly what proletariat i guess shall we say the 900 billion dollar stimulus was passed um what 600 dollars stimulus checks per person some unemployment extensions which i suppose is helpful finally it would have been more helpful three months ago but i suppose if you're gonna do it so anyway what do you guys think about this whole mess let's do the arithmetic on this i, I actually did the arithmetic and it's a $900 billion program. That means that uh, the uh, government is spending $2,700 or something like that for each and every taxpayer. $2,700 is what is country. Ind no, individual. I'm sorry, every individual. And if you want to count taxpayers, it would be probably about double that. Yeah. Uh, so for every individual, is uh, costing. it's costing every individual $2,700. And you're getting $900 back, plus maybe if you're unemployed, a few weeks of unemployment compensation. Mm -hmm. I somehow or another don't understand how that is a Christmas present, other, unless you want to think of us giving a Christmas present to the federal government, which, mm -hmm. of course, we do uh, every year and have been <coughs> since 1913. Well, the, 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 you're looking at this all wrong, Richard. It's a Christmas present for future generations. They they get this this present called debt, um, yeah. And and if debt wasn't wonderful, we wouldn't have what twenty seven trillion dollars worth of it. So more must yeah be yeah that's on budget, and then a hundred to two hundred trillion if you wanted to look at the uh, the off budget. Why you ask? Can they take twenty seven hundred dollars from us and give us nine hundred dollars back and call it a good deal? Well, of the 900 trillion, 284 tr uh, billion, I'm sorry, 900 billion, 284 billion goes to businesses, pure and simple. Now we're talking mostly zombie businesses and the kinds of businesses who uh, are uh, instrumental in keeping the, uh, shall we say, if we want to be conspiracy theorists about it, the deep state alive and well. I'm talking about nonprofits, the think tanks that uh, are uh, basically ro uh, revolving doors for personnel, uh, depending on whether Democrats or Republicans are in power, newspapers, television stations, radio stations, movie theaters, and uh, live theaters and other uh, entertainment. Live theaters. Theaters. Now, these are the kinds of uh, uh, kinds of uh, businesses that uh, absolutely are necessary to keep the uh, government is good narrative alive. They're buying well, off the media, buying yeah. off the media, pure and simple. Plus another $82 billion going to colleges and schools to make sure that we make sure that the uh, the youth are properly instructed as to the benevolence of Uncle Sam. I, 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 yeah, and I'm surprised there's not a package in there. It's probably hidden because a lot of publishing houses are, are, are independent still, or are they owned by multinational conglomerates? Well, I mean, uh, uh, Fox yeah. owns the publishing house. Um, yeah, most of them are probably, there might be a few independents left, but most of them are owned by by large uh, conglomerates, I would suspect. Uh, oh, it looks like, like Richard froze a little bit there. Yeah, well, yeah, we did see this weekend where uh, Tom Cruise, I guess, threw a cow because someone on his set didn't work in following protocols exactly. And, but of course, why are you out there making a movie? Like your movie is essential, but some guy working at the bar or some waitress who works at a bar that's now closed down, her job isn't essential, but Tom Cruise out make, making his running man movie because he's always running in a movie is somehow he essential. Well. It's, yeah, he looks good running. Hey, you yeah. gotta, gotta give him that. But you know that making movies and commercials and, and these things that's essential. But the, you know the poor schlep who's got to go trying to make his ends meet, their job doesn't count, and they get some three hundred dollars a week in uh, unemployment benefit after they've been unemployed because governors have shut their businesses down. It's yeah, and if you make more than seventy five thousand dollars, which is not a whole lot of money uh, these days, you get nothing. So you know the whole. How much thing. is it for for a married couple? 
I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah. who cares? I, you know, if you make any significant amount of money, you're, you're, you're paying only and you're not, you're getting nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the same old story. The government breaks the economy by uh, shutting it down unnecessarily and counterproductively. And then hands you a, uh, you know, breaks your leg, hands you a crutch and says, Hey, look at how nice we are. Mm. Breaks your leg, hands you a crutch. I like that. That's, that's a good, that's a good metaphor. That, that has I, I, borrowed that, I borrowed that from, from Joe Jorgensen, who borrowed it from Harry Brown. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good spot to, to kind of end this discussion on that, because we're, we're going to pay for this $900 billion for a long time. So it's not, this is a, you know, a stimulus based upon future economic growth. So it's not like it's free money. And the government did. The government broke down. It's not the pandemic. The media keeps calling this the, you know, the, the pandemic issue. Demic. Call it the panic demic. <laughs> but Let's but call yeah, it what it is. The government yeah. panicked, and so now we all have to pay the economic price. And now they're going to pat themselves on the back because they came and rescued us from their issues. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's a mess. But as we talk about a mess, you brought up. Um, teens and schools in there. We're going to go ahead and skip down to the bottom of our page here. And school choice, there was a study out recently that school choice reduces teen suicides. And at, right now with suicides spiking, and I think I just read a story out of San Francisco where um, drug overdose deaths are now more, there's more drug overdose deaths in San Francisco than there are COVID deaths. And so this mental health impact of our decision. And now we have this study that says school choice reduces teen suicide. So why aren't we just going full more on school choice now? I have the answer. Well, we should be. Go ahead. The answer is something called teachers unions. Um, and pure and simple, the teachers unions have all the money. And, and despite the recent, uh, you know, in California, when they, they uh, changed the way uh, teachers unions could take money from people uh, constitutionally uh, in the U.S., uh, when that um, to to where people had to opt in rather than opt out of union dues, especially the part of those dues that pays for political activity, and we all know that all of the teachers' dues should really be seen as political activity because all the union does is coerce more money out of the local government constantly, um, and it's like I don't know having having the workers. Um, who are producing cars decide on the rules for car safety and car mileage and car everything else. But the, the reason we don't have school choice is because if we had school choice, then all of these teachers would be unemployed and you can't have that because um, they wouldn't have jobs. And, and well, to be fair, they wouldn't, be, you know, they wouldn't all be unemployed, but they would all have to work with their money. They would have to mm -hmm. compete. Uh, equitably in a marketplace, just like uh, your uh, supermarkets have to compete mm -hmm. uh, with other supermarkets, just like uh, uh, commodity producers. You know, if you grow apples, you have to produce, you compete with other apple uh, apple growers. If you're uh, a manufacturer of whatever it is, you have to compete mm -hmm. with uh, with other manufacturers. If you're Sears, you have to compete with uh, uh, Amazon. Nobody and Walmart Sears, and, Sears and, out of business now. I just thought. Of well, it. okay, I, yeah. Which is, you know, what happens when you don't compete properly? Yeah. Uh, and the public schools would be out of business if they had to compete on a level playing field because they are not offering a product or a service that consumers would willingly pay for. The only reason yeah. we have kids going to public schools is because they have no choice mm -hmm. uh, and literally no choice. You're literally. truant if you uh, don't yeah. go. So it's essentially mm -hmm. uh, a prison system for our youth that uh, is used to indoctrinate them. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's antith antithetical to, uh, to liberty, it's antithetical to free thought, it's antithetical to uh, economic growth, it's antithetical to uh, a, uh, a stable and, and, and uh, happy society. And, yeah, and I'll, I'll, uh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was going to so, say that the, the study talked about getting away from your bullies, but if the system itself is your bully, like for me, it wasn't a bully. I didn't have trouble in school because of the, the system was wrong. Sending me into a school with a thousand other kids as someone who had an anxiety disorder was fundamentally just sending me into the wrong environment. And when you force kids into a you know, one size fits none environment, like John likes to say, we, government, 
program. We, uh, one size fits none. We end yeah. up hurting the very children we, we went around and we say we do this for the children, but we don't do it for the children. We do it no. for the system. And we that's, do it for, yeah. And that's Absolutely. the sad part. And, and the, the whole, uh, the news, and it would be even more filled with it if it wasn't one side toward the socialists. Um, the, the news is literally filled with uh, the facts that uh, students are being pulled from public schools whenever it is possible. Whenever their parents have the means, they put them in private schools. And I think in the state of California, upwards of 50% of public school teachers have their children, their own children, in private schools. These are poor teachers who have somehow found a way to uh, pay the seven to $17,000 a year it costs to put your kids in a private school. And so, um, you know, the facts are there that, that the, you know, when you talk about bullying and suicide, be, because of the self-written uh, rules that the, the um, public schools don't want to lose students because they're paid on headcount. So they don't like to discipline students, despite students beating each other up and bullying and all the rest of that. They say they, they, uh, there's like no strikes on this. And if somebody's physically, you know, bullying or bullying or uh, bu bullying is all over the place, but they don't, they keep people in, in the classroom because that's how they get paid. Whereas when we are in a private school and you try that crap, you're, you're out. Uh, the, the private school is more than willing to give up the, the money uh, to create a safe environment where people can actually learn. And I know because they have they have people who are competing to get into the private school. There is a yeah. demand there yeah. that doesn't exist for the public school systems, which are mm -hmm. essentially uh, uh, drafting people to come to school. Well, not to mention all the other kids who will leave if you're that one student's too disruptive. If that one student's disruptive, you've got ten who will leave. So mm -hmm. it's you're you're far better off kicking that one out, getting rid yeah. of that yeah. one. But, but under present school system, they can't. And time and again, and I think it's worth repeating every single time we we this subject comes up. The people who, who uh, are most in favor of school choice, voucher program, uh, some kind of uh, tax relief um, so that they can put their kids in private schools are poor people, not rich people. They are people in, we could call it the barrio, the ghetto. Uh, they are low income folks who send their, their kids off to these prison camps where they're bullied, where they learn about drugs. Uh, where they fall in with, with, with bad company. And if there was any possible way for them to legally pull their kids out, and these are typically either single family households or people where households where both parents work. So, you know, they're not in a position where they can put their children in pods or homeschool them. Uh, and, and many times they don't have the education themselves as parents to uh, provide the support that their children need to be homeschooled. If they did, they would do so. Um, and there's all sorts of, our tax dollars are being spent hand over fist to provide uh, internet service and, and laptops or, or, or surface or whatever like that. So these kids can learn at a distance, but the environment they're trying to learn from is horrible. So um, vouchers, um, tax rebates, whatever. Let's give poor parents who want their kids to have a better life than they have the means to force these public schools to compete. Because if they have to compete, we know this, they will provide a better product. Right now, they simply provide propaganda. Um, they talk about things like cisgen and socialism, and, and it's basically propaganda and a way for people to earn a very nice living in retirement on public teacher retirement benefits and pensions. So, and work, you know, but for in working eight, you know, nine, 10 months a year, you know, it's, it's a sweet deal for the unions. It's not for the students. And uh, we have private school for uh, rich kids. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. Private, you know, uh, uh, rich kids go to either either private schools or they segregate by uh, high uh, high uh, real estate tax uh, zip codes, so that the public schools in in, in rich enclaves are all mm -hmm. also good and also uh, heavily subsidized by their local communities. Uh, in the uh, in the poorer communities, uh, there's a, a crying need for uh, equal access to uh, quality education, which you can only get by 
making it non-mandatory and making the making it possible for uh, private schools to compete on an equal basis. Yeah, well, we'll uh, kind of end that one on with uh, when it comes to schools, we changed the relationship between the, the educated and the educators when we made schools mandatory. That no longer became a, a thing where they had to convince people to come to school. People now had to come to school under threat. And that simply changed the whole relationship between the educator and the educatee. Mm -hmm. And that's been a disaster. It just simply has been a disaster. Speaking of disasters and complete lack of self-awareness, Facebook accused Apple of using its power to harm developers and consumers and welcomed draft laws outlined by this new European Commission on... <laughs> <laughs> Regulate us, please. Yeah, well, that's, that's calling the that's the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, the uh, or yeah, snow calling Weiss right. I don't know what you want to say, but you know, basically, until um, the new I iOS new iOSs that Apple had that forced people to opt in to all the insidious behind the curtain magic that Facebook's doing in Google to provide information to its advertisers to track people, because that's how they make money is by selling information. Um, there was no problem with Apple. But now that Apple's, Apple's not you know, preventing people from letting Facebook or Google um, track people, they're just simply putting the, the power in the hands of the people that have the latest iOS on their phone or their laptop or whatever. And that's why Facebook's upset. No, they're not. They're not. It doesn't harm developers. Uh, Apple uh, invites. You know, yes, in the past, Apple liked to keep everything in house, but they they figured that when they opened up their their systems to developers, they made a heck of a lot more money because people could make more apps and programs for them. Apple has no problem at all with with developers. What Apple has a problem with is Facebook hiding all the things that hides and not bothering to tell people about it and Google hiding it. So it's, it's ludicrous. And the idea that a government agency, um, shall we, shall we call another layer of the deep state is now going to regulate this just frightens me to death because what's going to happen is they're going to have a back door to everything. They're going to insist that in order to make sure that there's a fair and level playing field, that they have access to basically at the machine language level to all of the stuff that that by law they shouldn't have access to. You watch when this thing passes, there's going to be a little codicil in it that says that the government has access to all this stuff um, that they're they're preventing private enterprise from doing. I I do business with some uh, some European organizations and have European news links and even before this upcoming thing. I've had to actually go in uh, every single time when I go to a new website, it says, hello, uh, we would like to do this, this, and this. What would you like us to follow? Well, there are some things, cookies, that we have to actually have to make the platform function, but uh, we're not going to track you or, or gather information or any way. You can, you can choose. You need to opt in. So fine and dandy, but when, when this thing comes out, uh, it's going to be intrusive big brother that will, I guarantee you, have a back door in the stuff that we don't want them having a back door into. So it's horrible. Yeah, and then this also relates to the Section 230 repeal uh, cheerleaders, which are coming from both the right and the left. Uh, and it's really coming from people who want to control uh, the flow of information. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, nothing except what does government approved propaganda ever get, ever sees the light of day. I remember back in the dark ages when the Clintons were actually in office, I remember Hillary Clinton lamenting that uh, with the rise of the internet, uh, namely Roger Court, uh, that, uh, and, the, and the whole Monica Lewinsky uh, uh, affair, uh, her, I remember Hillary complaining that back when it was ABC, NBC, CBS, the New York Times and Washington Post controlled essentially all of media, what, what, what was disseminated by the media uh, effectively, she had what she liked, which was gatekeepers. And she hated the fact that uh, there were no gatekeepers for drudge, no gatekeepers for the, uh, for the internet. And mm -hmm. Section 230 uh, says that the 
the internet is a platform, not a publisher. And as a platform, theoretically, everything goes. But because the politicians are really getting angry whenever their dirty deeds are uncovered, whether it's uh, Hunter Biden or whether it's uh, uh, Donald Trump, doesn't make any difference. Whenever the whenever the misdeeds of the politicians and the cronies are uncovered by independent media, the bipartisan support for ending, for, for, for calling uh, platforms publishers and thereby censoring them uh, goes into full scale. And that's why you've got people, that's why you've got both Google and Facebook trying to uh, censor what goes uh, on their platforms. They're doing it as a defensive measure, trying to keep their business model alive. It's well, unfortunate they, yeah. that they have to do that, uh, but that's what's going on. Well, then, and they did it. They did a stunningly good job of uh, all of the lamestream media in mass. Did a stunningly good job of stepping on any anti-Biden stories that were out there and promulgating any will of the wisp rumor that was anti-Trump during the last election cycle. And there's still the, these talking heads for the Clinton News Network and and the rest of the lamestream media are still speaking about the, the Russian connection and Russian connivance and, 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 uh, and, and not reporting the news that this is the, basically uh, uh, an attempted uh, a strike by, by the, the, the center of the democratic establishment to try to throw rumors out there to hurt uh, Trump's election campaign. That never gets discussed. They're still bringing up this yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you as mentioned that. If the whole, it was knowledge. Yeah. You Go mentioned that the whole the whole Russia conspiracy or the Russia allegations of the you know for the last four years, and it's interesting that uh, somebody uh, was able to get worm their way uh, into all of the uh, or a, a whole lot of uh, federal uh, agencies, Homeland Security, uh, Department of uh, of uh, Interior, I forget. Anyway, a bunch, a bunch of agencies. And energy, form of energy, yeah. Uh, and uh, I have I, immediately, we're blaming it on the Russians, or the media is blaming it on the Russians. I have not seen anything that directly links all of this espionage to the Russians. It may very well be the Russians, but it's really interesting how that's the first go to. It's like there's a county under the bed back in the 50s kind of. Uh, well, you notice that, that, that what they're not saying is that the, it's the Chinese because some, so for some reason uh, the, the Chinese are semi-untouchable, even though in, in their switching gear for telecom, they planted uh, uh, in a couple of their, their major manufacturers, planted little back doors so that uh, they could have access to basically all communications anywhere that travels over a, over a smart device. And it was discovered, and yet the, the go-to is not the Chinese who have, I don't know, probably, what, uh, 20 times the number of programmers uh, in that country, the number of people who can write code that the Soviet Union does. So why, why, don't we, why aren't we hearing about the Chinese? It's because the Chinese aren't the bogeyman they should be. Um, and, well, I don't know that either of them should be the bogeyman. I mean, yeah. uh, why do we have a Department of Homeland Security? Why do we have a Department oh, no, of I, I agree with all of that. You know, all of that, you know, if you didn't, didn't have all of these superfluous agencies, you wouldn't have to worry about them getting bugged. Well, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And, well let's point out that the Chinese were just brought up that uh, Eric Sawell had been had intimate relations with a Chinese spy and that they had there's well known information that the Chinese have infiltrated all levels of our government. It's actually not even all that unknown. The story just came out a couple months ago, but of course it all gets swept under the rug. And from someone who used to say, play on the outside of hacker circles, shall we say, if a hack obviously looks like it came from someplace, you can almost pretty much guarantee that's not where it came from. Hmm. Because well, anybody who's smart enough, anybody who is smart enough to pull off this kind of hack is smart enough to make it obviously look like it came from somewhere else. Mm. That's what hackers do. They cover their tracks. Yeah. It's, I, didn't know that, I didn't know that you were you had hacking uh, abilities, uh, James. Uh, back no, in, the, no, no. in the late no. 80s, early 90s, I was a young man during the times when the internet and all this stuff came up. I, we used, you know, we programmed in basic in my days. So this tells you how old <laughs> we are. <laughs> so I can't program a 
a, you know, a, a thing to get out of a paper bag. So these days, but back in the day when I was a young man and I had interest in that kind of thing, I knew how to, yeah, yeah, I played in the circles, but we don't, yeah, yeah. It's, you, you look at this stuff and you're going, if it's obvious it came from someplace, it didn't come from that place. It yeah. came from somewhere else. And want, that's wanna, just how these things work. I want to make, do, do a quick tag on to what Richard said. Um, it, and it might be part of an upcoming novel that um, threats make for job security. Um, terrorists make for Department of Homeland Security. Uh, fights over, over internet freedom make for government agencies and government reports and think tanks and, and uh, all the rest of the stuff. So, you know, if there's a threat of terror uh, and a constant threat of terror that can be, can be pulled out of the closet and waved as a flag, it allows a the government to to step on more of our freedoms, or maybe a the government to have all these agencies with a lot of people for it, and b the government to take away more of our freedoms, and that's exactly what's happening on a worldwide scale uh, with the internet right now. It's, it's and a lot of bloody shirts being waved around. Oh yeah, yeah, lots and lots. So uh, let's let's hope they don't they're not successful in it because you know if they take away the 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 platforms. Uh, definition as a platform and, and turn them into publishers, uh, we're going to have even more hell to pay than we have already. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do a lot of this stuff in the name of the common good. But, you know, when I look at history and the, you know, the common good is the excuse used for much of human tragedy. Mm. You can go back through all of the mass human tragedy and they were all started because it's for the common good, mm. you know? So the commons is a strange place. And if you don't aren't very careful about what you determine is the common good, then we all have to be very careful. And this is our Christmas show. And do any of you two have a Christmas wish for our viewers and for Access Sacramento? Here we've got a minute yeah, left. I've got, I've got a Christmas wish. I, I wish that uh, 2020 would be over. <laughs> That's a simple well, wish. I, I, and I wish that, uh, that the panic demic that, that here's what I wish that all the government overreach that is, uh, that has happened. And once the government grabs power, uh, you have to basically put a bullet in the back of their head to get them to give it up. They're not going to give it up. Uh, I wish that on January one, all of this overreach would end, or at least sometime during 2021. I'm, I'm sure it won't, but I, I hope that the, that the battle in 2021 and going forward to take back all the freedoms that we've lost in 2020 is less bloody and less painful than it might be. That's my, that's my Christmas hope. Oh, and today is my high holy day. It's uh, winter solstice. So um, happy winter solstice to all you pagans out there. <laughs> and well, my Christmas wish is that for everybody to get a chance to spend some time close with your friends and family as soon as we possibly can. And I think these days have been a trial for everybody. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank Access Sacramento for having us on. I want to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity to play host on this show. And that is all the time we have. Thank you for watching and good night. Merry Christmas, everybody. And thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.